Welcome to the Lightning eMotors Collins Bus Webinar on the EPA Clean School Bus Program. We really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about this amazing opportunity. The application is quick and easy, there is no match required, and the program allows selectees to receive funds before the buses are even delivered. I'm Marcy Willard, the Grants Manager for Lightning eMotors. In this session, we will provide an overview of our eligible Lightning Collins Type A school bus presented by Matt Pinkham, the Lightning OEM Accounts Manager. And then I will provide a summary of the Clean School Bus Rebate Program as well as step-by-step -step instructions for completing the application. At the end of the webinar, both Matt's and my contact information will be listed. Please feel free to reach out to either of us with questions you may have. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. All right, well, thank you, Marcy. My name's Matt Pinkham here at Lightning eMotors. I'm an OEM accounts manager, um, dealing directly with Collins on a, on a weekly and daily basis. Um, so we wanted to just give a little bit of a product overview about what some qualifying Lightning Collins vehicles will be. Um, so getting into it, we've got the Lightning Electric E450. So this is a school bus built on an E450 cutaway chassis. Some of the major points here are it's extremely quiet, extremely smooth. It's a lot more pleasurable driving experience for the drivers. That's the feedback we've got um, overwhelmingly from the market. Elegant cabin integration with batteries are fully under the floor. Ford vehicle warranty and matching Lightning powertrain warranty are applicable um, for both the school bus and everything that Lightning um, provides to the vehicle in terms of the electric powertrain. Installation, maintenance, and service performed by certified partners. So we've got a team of dedicated Lightning employees um, for customer service repairs, as well as an extensive network of service providers that are capable of, of working on these electric vehicles. Lightning analytics is another great thing for fleets and fleet managers. Um, it gives you great insight into your battery usage, day-to-day -day driving habits, HVAC usage, all things like that. And they're also available in a new or a repower um, vehicle. So some of the important features that the Lightning Collins Electric School Bus has is Park Paul. Park Paul is a thing that's going to eliminate that you possibly forgot to put your bra parking brake on. Um, it's a mechanical lever that's going to keep your vehicle in place. Another great feature we have is Creep, which is basically just meant to emulate an internal combustion engine. So when you're not touching either the accelerator pedal nor the brake pedal, um, the vehicle will creep forward, um, just like an ICE vehicle does. It's great for when you're at stoplights or cruising around parking lots, things like that. Another great feature is hill hold assist. So when you're parked on a hill, you if you're not touching either pedal, you're not going to roll backwards at all. And that's just another extremely important safety feature that uh, comes with all of our vehicles. And, and one of the best things is definitely regenerative braking. Um, it's basically instead of having to use your brake pads all the time to slow down your vehicle, you can actually use the electric motor um, to slow down the vehicle and that's going to generate power to put back into your batteries. Um, so it can really help lengthen your, your estimated range uh, for the vehicle. This is an example of uh, some real world data on a class 4 E450 bus. You can see right here some of the key data points that it gives is going to be your daily distance driven, how much battery capacity you used, um, what the ambient temperature was, daily efficiency, expected range, and then you can see with this graph here, you've got the green line indicating your state of charge going throughout the day, what uh, battery capacity you have. And then in the gray lines there, you can see your speed. So you can see a couple of stops and goes. Um, looks like this vehicle was traveling pretty consistently um, throughout the day. And then in these graphs down at the bottom, these pie charts, um, you can look at what components are using the most energy. Um, so you can see here that the motor is using most of the energy and that's great because um, that motor is going to be taking that energy and moving moving the vehicle and get distance out of it. Um, some other things that are going to use battery capacity are going to be your DC to DC converter, which is basically your alternator just keeping your 12 volt battery charged. Um, as well as the red bar there, that's going to be your HVAC usage. So if it's cold and you're using heat or vice versa, if it's hot and you're using um, air conditioning, that's going to affect your battery capacity and your overall range. Um, and so this pie chart kind of exemplifies how you were using each subsystem in the vehicle. Um, and, and the one in the bottom right here is pretty self-explanatory. It's time moving versus idle time. Um, so that gives some good insight to fleet managers um, as to how much time they're vehicles are going to be parked while still keyed on. 
Um, this is an example spec sheet for our E450 school bus with Collins right here. So a key thing to mention here is going to be charge times. Um, all of our buses are going to come with standard 13.2 kilowatt AC um, level 2 charging and up to 80 kilowatt DC fast charging. And so what that translates to into charge time is going to be about seven and a half to eight and a half hours on a level 2 charger or two to two and a half hours for a full charge on a DC fast charger. Electronically speed limited at 65 miles per hour. And like I mentioned previously, we've got a base warranty on the Ford chassis itself and a similar warranty for all of the Lightning E-Motors uh, powertrain componentry. Also an exciting thing we have here at Lightning E-Motors, um, a department of our company called Lightning Energy, um, which is really dedicated towards the overall implementation of charging infrastructure. Um, so through Lightning en Energy, we have a, a full suite of level two and level three chargers um, for purchase through us, um, as well as installation management. So we can help coordinate with local contractors and utilities, um, in infrastructure partners, things like that to make it as smooth as possible for you. We've also got a back-end management software. Um, so that really helps us, you know, get data from the charger, from the charging infrastructure um, to try to, um, you know, diagnose any issues, things like that, as well as load management um, to be able to charge um, not during peak hours, things like that, as well as any grant credit reporting that you might need. Also, a part of that is going to be warranty and service. So we've got remote diagnostics for all those chargers. Um, just like we have on the vehicle, we can get data from that charger and we can uh, remotely diagnose any issues that there might be. And on top of that, we've got route planning management, which can help um, plan for what kind of vehicle you guys will need, what kind of charging infrastructure and where it needs to be located. Um, so it's an extremely important part of our company and financing as well. So Obviously, with all this EPA school bus money coming out, hopefully financing isn't a huge issue, but um, the EPA has mentioned that they're willing to work directly with end users as well as financing partners um, to get electric vehicles in as many people's hands as possible. So these are great use resources and uh, definitely worth, worth utilizing. And on top of that, LCFS and grant ma management. Um, so for low carbon fuel standards, um, as well as grant management, we have a whole team here um, dedicated to help with grants, with financing, with LCF credits. Um, so it's a great thing to utilize that here at Lightning. So with all that being said, I'm going to pass it back to Marcy Willard, um, who is going to show you all about how to apply for this EPA school bus money. Thanks. Thank you, Matt, for the great information on the Type A bus. I will now provide a brief summary of the Clean School Bus Rebate Program, but please know that the EPA website is a great resource for additional information. After I go through the summary, I will then provide step-by-step -step instructions for applying for this rebate program online. As you will see, there is $500 million in the 2022 program and at least $500 million a year for a total of five years. So as you research this program, if you find your district is not ready this year, there will be four additional funding rounds allowing you the time to put your plan in place. The program is currently open with the application deadline August 19th, 2022. Awards are expected to be announced in October of this year with vehicles and charging in deployment and installed by October 2024. This provides an ample runway for the purchase of the vehicles, installation of the charging uh, by 2024. Eligible applicants include public school districts, public charter schools, and eligible contractors with the capacity to sell to school bus owners and or arrange financing for sale. Prioritization criteria is applied to applications with districts serving high need populations and low income areas on the top of the list. A link online provides a list of districts that meet the prioritization criteria per state. Up to $285,000 is available in a rebate per Type A bus for prioritization districts and up to $190,000 for districts that don't meet the prioritization criteria. On to charging, up to $20,000 is available for charging infrastructure for the prioritization districts and up to $13,000 for the non-prioritization districts. 
Districts can apply for up to 25 new buses. So imagine what that could do with your district's fleet. One old bus must be scrapped or sold for each new replacement bus. But in this program, both diesel and gas vehicles may be replaced, and it's not necessarily contingent upon the age of the vehicle. Old buses must have operated at least three days a week in the 21-22 school year, and all new buses must serve the district for at least five years from the date of that deployment. Federal funds in the Clean School Bus Program are not stackable with other federal funding, but other funding sources such as state-based grants may be allowed and could possibly combine with the EPA funds. The award, however, cannot exceed the total project cost. Applications are submitted 100% online with an application form and spreadsheet, which includes the old buses that are being scrapped or sold, and which new vehicles the district intends to purchase if awarded the rebate. The target of the program is to fund at least one district in each state with no more than 10% of the total funds allowed per state. When you go on to the EPA website, there is a variety of information available, including further details to what I just shared, as well as the actual application and this application user guide. And this is what we will be going through today as it provides a step-by-step -step list of directions for filling out the application. I certainly encourage you to have this up on a laptop while you're filling out the application if you need to use it as a reference. It shows a table of contents. It indicates a glossary at the end of this document in case you don't understand some of the terms that are used. But most importantly, let's talk about what you should gather before you begin. This will make it much easier when you go to apply if you already have this information gathered. The first thing is a SAM.gov unique entity identifier number. Many of you may already have that, but if you don't, you can apply through a link on the EPA site to create that account. If you already have a SAM.gov Unique Entity Identifier, UEI, please verify that the designated point of contact is the person filling out this application, and if not, please edit the account to reflect this new point of contact. The UEI is required by the federal government and is a unique entity generated and issued by the federal government. You will need to confirm accuracy of your bank account numbers in case you receive a rebate, as well as addresses. You will also need the seven-character NCES, National Center for Education Statistics ID, associated with the school district that will be served by the buses being replaced. If you don't know this, there is also a link on the EPA site that quickly identifies this number for you. You will need to prepare a clean school bus inventory spreadsheet of your old buses, and this should include the VIN, the manufacturer, the model and model year, estimated mileage and fuel consumption, GVWR in pounds, that's the gross vehicle weight rating of the vehicle, as well as scans of bus titles and registrations. For the new buses you are applying for, you will need an estimated GVWR, again, that weight rating on the new vehicle, as well as the fuel type. Before filling out the rebate application, make sure the web browser version meets or exceeds the following versions. Chrome 38, Safari 7.1, Internet Explorer 11, or Firefox 13. Now that you've gathered all this information, let's get started. This has application information as well, and I will scroll down now to page six where we get started. This is where you will access the online rebate application. You will first choose sign in, and then you will choose login. If you haven't created a login.gov before, you will be able to do so here. You will then agree to the terms 
of service and then enter your sam.gov point of contact email address and password. You will sign in and create your account. At this point, you will receive a confirmation email. So please follow that email and confirm the link. You will then be prompted to create a password for this specific application. Hit continue. The last step will be to select an authentication method and go through this process and submit. We are now ready to start the actual application. On this page, you will select New Application, and then you will select the pencil icon to open the form, which will have auto-filled using your UEI information. In some rare cases, you may have more than one UEI EFT combination. That's your unique entity identifier along with an electric funds transfer. Again, some districts may have multiple, some may just have one. If you do have more than one, then please select the correct option in this new rebate application. Along the way, you will see that if you hover over this information icon, it will provide additional information in each topic area. Please note that you should not use your browser back and forward button as that will result in the loss of work. As you go through the application, when you select Next, it automatically saves, as well as there also being a Save button if you would like to use that as well. That will allow you at any time prior to the deadline to come back in and add additional information and complete the application as you have time. You are also encouraged to do it in one setting, but please know you can accept and save your work along the way. You will see this welcome screen. And now we will move forward with the applicant type. This section requires information about the applicant type. You will see some drop-down questions here that you will need to answer, including whether the district owns the buses that will be replaced. As you go through the application, if you see any indication highlighted in red, that's a sign that there is missing information and you will be required to fill that in before you can move forward. Additional applicant information is required here. The upper portion will automatically be filled in with your SAM.gov information, but you will need to enter a primary and optionally an alternate contact for your organization and hit next. If the buses in your district are owned and operated by a private fleet, you will fill out this section and choose next. If you own your buses, you will not have to complete this page. Now we'll address the school district information section where it collects information on the school district. Most information again will be auto-filled after entering your NCES ID number that we discussed at the beginning, and you will fill out any other required information that's not auto-filled and hit next. This application does conveniently include a link to identify your NCES if you don't already have it. This screenshot shows the process for looking this up. And again, the link is included in this part of the application if you get to this point and do not already have this number. 
And ultimately, you'll end up with this screen, and here's that seven character ID number. After that, you will address the estimated student poverty rate. Most districts will already be identified, but in some cases, the applicant may need to self-certify by filling out this section and then choose next. Now we get to the fun part, talking about your new buses. And so they will ask for the information we discussed at the beginning, starting with the information on the old buses that will be scrapped. You will do a page for each bus up to the 25 that you are allowed to apply for. You will see a line here for each of the required information about the buses being scrapped. Again, that includes the VIN, the manufacturer, the model, the model year, the average annual mileage, average annual fuel consumption, fuel type, GVWR, and you will need to attach the title and registration by uploading documents onto this page. You will also add the replacement bus fuel type and its GVWR. There is a drag and drop feature as well as a browse link to help upload these documents. Again, you will do this for each bus that you apply for by using an add bus button. Once you've completed that, the total funds requested will be automatically calculated. If there are missing or out of range values detected, they will once again be highlighted in red for your attention and this will need to be edited before you will be allowed to move forward. So as you can see, once you've gathered your information and get through those first number of accounts, the SAM.gov, the login.gov, you can see that it really doesn't require very much information. And I'm very appreciative <clears throat> of this program in particular because they have made it simple. And it's so important that we get these zero emission buses on the road. So this is an opportunity where you can review and sign your application. You must agree <clears throat> to the certification here. You can, at this point, review the entire document by using the previous button, and that will allow you to go through the entire application to make sure all the information is entered correctly before proceeding. Once you have done so, you will submit the application. You will receive then a confirmation email confirming receipt of your submission with an application number. Please save this information in case you need to contact the EPA down the road or need to revise your submission prior to the deadline. You will see here the glossary I talked about at the beginning in case there are any terms that you're unfamiliar with. Throughout the online application process, you can have this EPA user guide available to help as you fill out the actual application in real time. Again, while there appears to be a lot of information involved, once you have the SAM.gov, UEI, know your NCES number, and have the information on the old and new buses, it's simply a matter of taking time to fill out the blanks. We appreciate this opportunity at Lightning E-Motors and Collins Bus to have provided this valuable information to you about this truly exceptional opportunity to replace gas and diesel with zero emission buses. Please contact us with any questions and we will respond immediately. I hope you have a great day and we look forward to working with you. All right. Well, thank you for all that good information, Marcy. One other thing I wanted to add is that here at Lightning, we have just produced a video with Collins explaining all about the Collins Lightning Electric School Bus. It's a five minute video. We're going to tack it on to the end of this video here. I really encourage you all to watch it and uh, enjoy. Thanks. Hi, I'm Chris Hebert, Director of Operations at Collins Bus Corporation. This may look like a typical Type A Collins bus with the standard safety features, school bus compliant seating, warning lights, traffic control, but it's actually quite different underneath. 
I'm here with Matt Peacom from Lightning E-Motors. Matt, what does it mean when we say this is electric? Yeah, so it means it has no internal combustion engine at all. It's driven strictly by an electric motor. So no emissions? No emissions at all, that's correct. No tailpipe emissions, uh, which is great for the environment and arguably even more important for the children. Well, that's great, tell me more. The traction motor is the electric engine which propels the bus along the road. There's a single speed gearbox, so there's a smooth acceleration with no shifting. This gearbox drives the drive shaft, which runs to the rear axle. We've got four lithium ion battery packs with enough energy storage to drive over 120 miles. Then we have the thermal management, which keeps those batteries in their Goldilocks temperatures, so it's not too hot and not too cold. A power inverter converts the DC electricity that comes from the batteries to AC electricity that powers the motor. Then we have various accessories which provide power steering, cabin air conditioning, and heat and so on. And finally, there's an onboard controller which is basically the brains of it all. Matt, you mentioned thermal management for the batteries. Why is that important? Yeah, that's extremely important just to extend the life of the batteries themselves. So with all this technology on board, is it complicated for the driver? Yeah, not at all. In almost all regards, it's a very similar driving experience for the driver. Key it on, wait for the ready indication, push the accelerator pedal, and you're on your way. The driver won't even know that they're driving an electric vehicle. Well, not quite. There's a few key indications that are different. Firstly, it's a lot quieter. Second of all, it's a lot quicker and smoother acceleration because of the torque output of the electric motor. And lastly, regenerative braking. Regenerative braking? Tell me about that. So regenerative braking is taking the momentum of the vehicle and putting that power back into the batteries as opposed to discharging it as heat through your brake pads. So what that regenerative braking feels like to the driver is basically the equivalent of engine braking. So you can basically drive these electric vehicles with one pedal, feather the accelerator pedal and it feels like you're braking. It also kicks on the brake lights so that the people behind you know that you are slowing down. The main benefits of regenerative braking are going to be overall better efficiency. Um, by recapturing that energy back into the battery system, you can make your range longer. Um, and the second is going to be your brake component life. You're going to be using way less brake pads because that motor is slowing you down as opposed to brake pads. So what will we see if we look under the hood? Well, let's take a look. So it looks quite a bit different than a gasoline engine, doesn't it? So in here we've got various components that uh, operate the vehicle. Controllers, power distribution, different things of that nature, um, as well as the existing 12 volt battery. Oh, so there is an alternator. There is not an alternator. So we've got basically the equivalent component of an alternator, which we call a DC to DC converter. It takes high voltage DC current from the batteries, steps it down to 12 volt to keep your 12 volt charged. Very cool. Let's take a look at the driver's environment. Yeah, you're right. It looks pretty familiar to me. Yeah, it does. And this, uh, this unit's equipped with a traditional instrument panel cluster. You can see a few things here. We've got a power gauge, which that is going to indicate when it's in the green, you're going to be putting battery back into the batteries. And when it's in the blue, you're going to be discharging power. Um, a couple of other things is on the right, it's going to tell you your power gauge, so how much power you've got left. So at Lightning, we've transitioned to a totally digital dash display. On the left side, you're going to have a power meter similar to this, telling you discharge and charging of the batteries. You're also going to have a very readable speedometer in the middle, um, as well as a state of charge and range indicator, which is going to tell you in real time how much range you have left for the vehicle. In the top left corner, you'll see a graph that's indicating in real time your efficiency that'll help the driver monitor how, uh, how well they're driving. So let's talk about charging. Yeah, so at Lightning, we've uh, designed the charging system to be pretty flexible. We've got AC and DC charging, um, and we can accept either one. Is one better than the other? So it really depends on the use case for the vehicle. DC fast charging is a lot faster, hence the name, um, whereas AC charging is a little bit slower really depends if you need a quick top up, DC fast charging is great. If you've got the whole night to charge, you can use AC charging. So if, if anyone's got questions about it, we've got people working at Lightning to help answer those questions. Thanks Matt for that walkthrough. I really learned a lot. Yeah, at Collins, we're really excited to offer our new EV electric with our partners, Lightning E-Motors. We're really excited for the impact this is gonna have on not only our customers, but also our environment.